What are you doing? I need to film. This isn't helping. Hi, I'm Crimson Rogue, here to review Handbook for Mortals, and this is my cat to make sure that I don't go insane. Yep, won't have access to my notes for a while. She is staying there. Oh, as soon as I pull the book up, my, my support animal leaves me. Handbook for Mortals by Lanny Serum. Well, like Empress Teresa, Handbook for Mortals is one of those semi-famous internet stories. And because we haven't had a down the rabbit hole video on this yet, I guess it's up to me to tell you how screwed up this is. It's really bizarre. The story itself is nothing special and nothing to get worked up about. It sucks. Trust me on that. I got plenty of notes. But the backstory, the behind the scenes stuff about this is so much more fascinating. And you're probably familiar with one, maybe two controversies. There's more than that. I normally don't bother researching the author that heavily or things about the book before I do one of these reviews. I try to let the book speak for itself, but I couldn't help it this time. There was so much. I, I just, I found one little nugget and then I found another little nugget and then I just kept going. And the more you go, the more of, a, of an understanding you have about the utter ineptitude of this book. But starting off, who is Lanny Serum? Well, Lanny Serum has been involved with uh, music and TV and movies uh, apparently since she was three, or so she claims. And we're not talking huge, notable deals. It's perfectly all right if you've never heard of her. Uh, one of her most famous roles was managing a band called 100 Monkeys. I'd never heard of them before either. But along her multiple careers, she was able to meet several people, do a lot of networking, and get her foot in several doors. Which is why she thought she had a chance at genuine success with Handbook for Mortals. Which is interesting because if that were all true, you think that she wouldn't have to cheat. Perhaps the biggest controversy about this book, and the one that most of you are familiar with, is what happened with the New York Times bestsellers list. See, in 2017, when this book was published, the number one spot for young adult novels was The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. And then all of a sudden, this book comes along and topples it, takes the number one spot. And it was interesting because no one had really heard about this. No one had really heard about the author. It wasn't some up and coming presence. It wasn't it's so unique uh, of a narrative that it just had to be heard. No press conferences, no celebrity endorsements. Nobody knew anything about this. And yet there it was. Number one on the New York Times bestsellers list uh, for, for several thousand sales pretty much overnight for 23 hours. You see, what had happened is uh, you've got to understand a little bit about the publisher. This was published by a, a group called Geek Nation. Geek Nation was very new to publishing. In fact, I believe this is their first book. And this is one of those kind of open secrets that they're not really admitting to, but they wanted to try to get this up to number one on the uh, New York Times list in order to get some movie rights going, because it just sounds so much better based on the New York Times number one bestseller book. Here's the problem, though. Geek Nation and Serum bought thousands of copies of this book to artificially boost sales from book distributors like Barnes & Noble. Some internet sleuths dug into that. They contacted the New York Times bestsellers list, and this was bumped off the uh, bestsellers list after about one day. To be clear, this was not a failure on the New York Times list. They just saw the raw numbers and reported what they had. When they actually dug into it, they found out it was fraudulent, so they scrapped it. This is something that Serum defends to this day. See, these were just copies that they bought to uh, sell at, at conventions and book signings and things like that. The book came out because we had been pre-selling them at all these cons, mm. and the only way to make book sales count when you sell them at cons is to push them through bookstores. And a lot of authors, most authors, publishers, do put the sales through bookstores. So uh, we did what kind of everybody does, but I guess when the book came out, it, it showed up on the YA list, and it's mm. technically not a YA book if you ask someone who's very in the book world because the main character's in her 20s mm. and not 13 to 18. Here's the problem with that. When authors do that, they generally don't buy their books in bulk from distributors. They get them straight from the printer. 
That way sales numbers aren't affected. And if you think Sarum is trying to shy away from the controversy, quite the opposite. She actually posts it quite proudly out in the open at book signings at conventions. It was kind of just, it was, it was kind of a crazy ride in that I'm actually the only author that's ever been pulled off the list. So, you know, that kind of makes me cool in that way. Well, it's and kind of like an honor too, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah. I'm would, a rebel. I'm a rebel. Yeah, I've always yeah. been a rebel. So. so if you think she feels remorse, no. And if you thought that was the only inept controversy involved, you are unfortunately wrong. There is another controversy quite literally attached to the cover of this book. Now check this out. As covers go, this actually isn't that bad. I actually kind of like it. The art's done pretty well. There seems to be some degree of symbolism with the moons up top, the water on the bottom. She's standing in front of a bullseye with some throwing knives stuck in. It's actually not too bad. I kind of like it. I also kind of like the original artwork that this was plagiarized from. The cover art for this book was drawn by a guy named Kevin Kincaid. The original artwork is known as The Knife Thrower by Gildel Mace. The official Handbook for Mortals Facebook page actually admits that this was a mistake and they've reached out to Gildel Mace and, and uh, his group in order to support the spirit of cooperation. Stop playing with that. I don't even understand the point of stealing the artwork in the first place. The, there are two reasons I can think of that they would bother doing that. The first one is they were lazy and thought they could get away with it. And the second one is the original artwork captured something so central to the book, so identifiable with the narrative that they just had to have it and decided to be scumbags and not actually reach out to the original artist. But it can't be that second option because there's nothing that really matches this anywhere in the book. I mean, that's the protagonist there right there front and center with her multicolored hair and the rose in her mouth. But I don't understand what the bullseye's for. There's like one tenth of a chapter where she's targeted for something and that's it in the entire book. Nothing else really works there. The moon thing is kind of a, a an add-in from the original artwork, so that wasn't copied, but that could have been added with original artwork. There aren't even any throwing knives in the book, as far as I can recall, not in any meaningful sense anyway. The cover is a golden display of laziness, scumminess, and ineptitude. And when you think about it, that is a good indicator of what's in this book. So, no more stalling, let's actually get into this stupid thing. There are other controversies that I want to talk about, but We'll save them for later when they become a little more relevant. And uh, before I forget, as part of my research, I wanted to thank uh, Jenny Trout. Uh, go check out her blog, because she's done a lot to cover a lot of this book, and her blog is hilarious. And also check out Generally Pookie, who basically does the same thing that I do, but as an animated blue penguin. The fact that she only has a thousand subscribers is a miscarriage of justice. Oh my god. Right out their conversation, Sarum. Right out Sherry's flirting. Right out Jackson proposing to be the Bradley Cooper to her Lady Gaga. Show me the fluffy shit in real time, ho! Right at the very beginning, we're treated to a forward by someone named Sky Turner, who's apparently another author whose works I've never heard of, but she claims to be a friend of Sarum's, so she's writing this forward. Generally speaking, if you're going to include a forward in your book, you want it written by someone with a bit of notoriety to their name. Sure, you can have a friend write a forward for you, but if the reader doesn't know who that friend is and, and doesn't have a sense of scale of that friend's understanding of literature, then you might as well have the forward written by your mom. Oh, my sweetie pie did such a good job with this book. I'm sure you'll love it. That's why I don't do old lady voices. Although, and I was actually, I've proven myself wrong on this, but originally, I thought the foreword was written by Sarum herself. Because the second paragraph of the foreword has a very strange tell. I've known Lanny, that's Lanny Sarum, for a few years now. It is Lanny, or as she would say, Annie with an L, just in case you were wondering. At first, I wasn't even sure of the pronunciation of her name. Was it Lanny or lan -E? In the subsequent years, I've learned how to pronounce her name, and throughout our friendship, I've also learned she's a bit of a gypsy soul. So you'll notice a few things about that. Uh, it's wordy, 
Uh, the punctuation isn't great. These are two indicators of Sarum's writing style, by the way. But the overfocus on pronunciation is something that we see in the rest of the book. Two characters, the protagonist and her mother, get paragraph-long sections about how to pronounce their names. And it is so ridiculous. Now, there are certainly words out there that uh, you, you might not know how to really pronounce if you only read them. Colonel is a famous example. Uh, I admit, I screwed up Hermione's name from Harry Potter when I first read it. But the main character's name is Zaid. That's it. It's not complicated. It's not filled with confusing letters or symbols, so I don't understand what the big deal is. I think the author just has some weird internal struggle with people mispronouncing her name as she was growing up, which makes me wonder how people could get Lanny wrong. Son of a bitch! You done messed up, A.A. Ron! Okay, but bypassing the forward, we go to the table of contents. Yeah, I'm, I'm really going over all the the really important stuff here, aren't I? Actually, I'm putting out the table of contents because this is kind of a mark in the book's favor. This is actually kind of a clever idea. Now, it starts off with chapter zero, and that's not some I'm so different way of saying it's a prologue. It's a proper chapter, but the chapter title is The Fool. And after that, you get the magician, the hermit, the hierophant, the empress, the emperor, all things like that. Those are all arcana within tarot cards. And apparently the fool is associated with the, the number zero and uh, what was it? The magician is one, hermit is two. Apparently there's an order to it. I don't really understand tarot cards myself, so I'll rely on someone more, more nuanced with that to explain it, but right off the bat, at least on a surface level, there's some degree of thought put into it. And then to read the first line of the of chapter zero and all that hope gets dashed against the rocks. I've always envied those with normal lives. Right off the bat, you got some top tier edgy girl cringe. You can just smell the hot topic. She's not like other girls. Totally different, not like other girls. And if it seems like I'm harping on this one point, it's only because the entire first paragraph does. I've always envied those with normal lives. I don't think I've ever even had a normal month a plain week, or an average day. At best, I've had brief, normal moments here and there. They tend to be few and far between. I'm sure most people would envy me, but some days I think I'd trade places in a heartbeat. To me, those moments of feeling normal or getting to do average things have always felt like a cool, sparse breeze on the hottest summer day, or the first breath you take after holding it underwater for as long as you can. I'm gonna do what I can to minimize reading too much, but one of the things you will notice in this book is that it is padded to hell. This is another one of those books where they took a novella's worth of story and stretched it out to over 400 pages. It's actually so bad that most of the chapters can be accurately summed up with single sentences. And of course, there's the way that the protagonist actually describes herself. I glanced at myself in the reflection of the car side mirror. People tell me I'm pretty all the time. Beautiful even. I am not sure I see what they see. I think I'm more of a cute, average looking girl. I'm slender, but I do not believe most would say skinny. Not hot girl skinny, at least. I have long legs that are toned, but I think my thighs are too large and I do not have a thigh gap. My arms are kind of flabby, and while I do have an hourglass figure, I have always felt my butt is a little too big and my face is a bit too round. So I might as well get this out of the way. Uh, there is a central problem with the way that the protagonist is approached, and I'm sure a good number of you have already figured it out. The main character, Zaid, is a self-insert Mary Sue. Serum has admitted that Zaid is her take on a perfect life. Zaid is what Serum's life would be like if everything went her way. And she is such a Mary Sue that it actually outshines Twilight. As I describe the book and what happens to Zaid, feel free to debate in the comments whether or not she is a worse Mary Sue than Empress Teresa, but if you had to ask me, 
I'm honestly not sure. Now, I don't really have a problem with the concept of self-insert characters. After all, I think that it actually does the story a little bit of good if the author is able to put a little bit of themselves into the characters. Maybe not to the point where it's a carbon copy of themselves, but just that little knowledge of expertise on a certain subject or a, a certain enjoyment for the way coffee tastes in the morning or whatever. Something like that can add a lot more depth to the character and a lot more feeling to the story as a whole. And I'm not just saying that as someone who wrote his own self-insert fanfiction for a couple of years. Don't read it, it's cringy as fuck. However, when you combine a self-insert character with a Mary Sue character, the results are downright unbearable. Because at that point, the story stops being about anything and just starts being about why the main character is so amazing. The story doesn't mean anything at that point. It's just a display of the the author self belating themselves. In fact, the entire first chapter is about uh, the, the main character, who she is, what she believes. It's, you've got some tepid philosophy thrown in there. Then she gets in her car and moves away. You can do very, really simple uh, chapters like that. You can do chapters where you focus on very little in order to emphasize very minute aspects. The first chapter of the first Dark Tower book uh, does this spectacularly. It just describes the gunman and the desert he's walking through. That is really all the detail you get, and it really works. First off, because both of those are told in interesting ways with a competent writer, and also because the chapter doesn't go on for half an eternity. You give just enough to properly color the reader's imagination, and you don't overstay your welcome. If you over-explain everything and you talk to your reader like they're idiots and they need to be guided by the hand, they're not going to have a very fun story. And oh my god, does this violate that so many times! Now, one of my earlier problems with the writing style as a whole comes down to the way information is provided. A great example of that is early in the uh, first chapter where she starts off with, for me, I will never forget one particular July morning. And then we don't get any information about that uh, one July morning for about two pages. She instead talks about her hair, the weather, the town that she lived in and the full history therein, what her mother does for a living, and what all the people in town think. And most terrifying to me, she talks about having chunky pieces on the lower half of her long hair. As someone with long hair, I have no idea what you're talking about. Use a better shampoo. I actually thought that she was supposed to be, like, homeless or something at the very f start of the, the book, which would have made for an excellent rags-to-riches kind of a story. But, uh, no, she just has gross hair. Anyway, this writing style is eerily similar to what's called a stream-of-consciousness writing style. An artsy type of writing, which I don't like at all. Broadly speaking, it's supposed to get you into the head of the writer as their thoughts meander around all these different subjects and you see their thought process as they go from point A to point B to point G. There are instances where a stream of consciousness writing style can work and initially I thought that Zade was supposed to be this spritey, bubbly airhead, but apparently that's not what the author was going for. So the writing style just looks vapid and unfocused. Granted, that's how most stream of consciousness writing comes across, but it just becomes this unfocused example of diarrhea of the mouth as the main character refuses to shut up about anything and gives you every minute detail of her life because she's the most interesting person she knows about. Of course you want to know every single detail of her life. Stream of consciousness, for when reason, plot, structure, and entertainment is just too much to ask for. We also learn that she lives in Centertown, Tennessee, which is a real place. Uh, I actually looked it up. As of 2010, according to the census, they have a population of 243, so bumfuck nowhere. Ah, but if you're worried she's going to be a perfect Mary Sue without any flaws or defects or, or negative personality traits, don't worry, she's got you covered. Due to my dyslexia, I could write things perfectly, but I wrote them backwards. It wasn't till I was nine, almost ten, I could write the proper way without a lot of thought. So she's dyslexic, but you can't tell. That's not how dyslexia works. 
Also, this is the only time in the entire book where that ever comes up. She introduces that she's dyslexic and never mentions it again. I chewed hard on my lip. A nervous tick of mine that I did so often I had a permanent dent on my bottom lip. Bella Swan Harder. This book apparently attempted to capture some of the Twilight craze because there's a love triangle in here, and trust me, we'll get to that mess in a little bit. But it was published in 2017, well after the Twilight craze had died down. This is like creating a story about a jovial family that solves mysteries in order to cash in on the Happy Hollisters craze. So we move on to an actual portion of plot and we find out why Zade is leaving home. This is never actually explained in the book, and I had to get this by reading Jenny Trout's blog. Again, go check her out. But the mother, like, did something, and it really pissed off Zade, and I thought that this was gonna be build up for some sort of payoff way later in the book, when mother and daughter had to reconcile to solve some greater issue, and no, it never really shows up again. Actually, I know. What do you think started this? I said firmly. For the record, I can't believe you would stoop to anything so low. Please, what? Haven't you ruined enough of my life? It's implied that the mother used magic to get Zade to stay at home when Zade wanted to go out and be free because she's not satisfied with life where she stands out. Why would I want to stand out? People who stand out get things thrown at them. People who stand out get called names and shoved into lockers. If the people who don't stand out are too cowardly to do any of the previously mentioned options, then they just awkwardly whisper about you, the people who do stand out, as you walk by. God, that's hideous writing. So what's her solution? Where is she gonna go where she doesn't stand out? Why, to Las Vegas to become a performer, of course! Gonna be honest, I did not expect that take. So Zade makes her way to Las Vegas to audition at the Wynn Casino where she will be working with Charles Spellman, who is apparently the peer to David Copperfield. And despite being a nobody, and despite over 200 people that have jobs working at this theater, everyone was waiting around, jabbering with each other, waiting for Zade to show up. I cleared my throat and softly said, Thank you for waiting. I'm ready. I smiled nervously and pushed the door open even wider to welcome them back into their theater. And eventually we do get to the edition, but the chapter is littered with some of the most amazingly wordy drivel I have ever come across. Now naturally in a new environment like this, you'd have descriptions for new place, new characters, you'd get a few details, you know, what they look like, a few basic mannerisms. Serum has decided to give you everything. Take, for example, one of the stagehands named Tad, a character of middling importance. Serum describes him in one of the most impressively explosive displays of pointless bloviating that I have ever seen since I read the first page of Finnegan's Wake. Hold on to your butts. I quickly spotted Mac again. He had found a place to stand next to two of his crew guys, also in stage blacks. One was Tad who helped me with a door earlier. He looked to be about Mac's age, though shorter than Mac. Tad was slightly stockier, with dark wavy brown hair and brown jovial eyes. I would soon learn that Tad was Mac's best friend, an all-around good guy who worked well with everyone. In theory, Mac was Tad's boss, but they had been working together for a long time and had been friends for much longer. Tad was the kind of guy to always tell it like it is. He never believed in sugarcoating anything. He'd always tell us that his motto was, why taking anything seriously? No one gets out alive anyway. He said it often and meant it. Very little of him got worked up. He was the epitome of easygoing. Tad was also one of those people who was naturally good at most of the things he tried. I often wonder if a lot of it had to do with his attitude. I've concluded that it must be that, and being born under a lucky star. I'd probably envy him if it did if I didn't adore him so much. By this point in the book, she has not even met this character, and yet we get everything about him. We even get his stupid motto. Writing a character like this is abysmal because it takes away any mystery, any intrigue that that character could possibly hold. Part of the reason why three-dimensional characters are good is because they can surprise you, which can make for a fun experience if you're watching a movie or reading a book or playing a game. For example, in the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, when J. Jonah Jameson was attacked by Green Goblin. Who's the photographer who takes the pictures of Spider-Man? 
I don't know who he is. His stuff comes in the mail. You're lying! I swear. He'd been a complete jerk to everyone up to that point, and yet refused to give away the name of an otherwise irrelevant freelance photographer. That's depth, that's dimension, that is good character writing, because deep down, despite his rough surface, he's a good guy at heart. You never get that from any of the characters in this book. It's everything is surface level to a very grating degree. Nothing is surprising, nothing is engaging, nothing really hooks you in. And those introductions go on for just about every single character in that chapter, including Charles Spellman, the head of the show, Mac Kent, the technical director, Cam Carter, the head rigger, Tad, Mac's best friend, Pete Trigg, Beth, the HR lady, Sophia Austin, the girlfriend of Spellman and kind of the lead mean girl, Zeb Zagan, the head technician, Riley, the new guy. And those are the characters introduced in just this chapter. That list keeps going. You also have Lil, the gothic costume designer, and Jackson, one of the love interests and the leader of the house band. So Zade introduces herself to Charles Spellman. Uh, I don't know if that's lazy nomenclature or if it's an intentional reference to Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but whatever. And we get another one of her flaws. I was babbling and didn't really know what to say. It's something I always do when I'm nervous, and the only thing that really makes me nervous is meeting important people. Now this is an interesting flaw because it's one of those things that Zade brings up once and never again. Sure, she's a little wordy at the beginning when she meets with Spellman, but that's it. After this, nothing. And I think this is a sharp distinction between Zaid and Serum stepping in for the narrator. If Zaid really was as wordy as she claims she is, then we would see extra dialogue from her, but we never get that. Instead, we get extra prose. So it doesn't seem like Zaid talks a lot, it seems like Serum talks a lot. And considering the interviews I've seen of her, I absolutely believe that. You, Start doing it, it. it is true. I, I've been called the most persistent person on the planet. I take it as a compliment. Um, <laughs> but you know, if you if you want to do something in life, just go do it. Like, and don't let people tell you no because people will, and people will tell you no for a variety of reasons. They'll tell you no because they're jealous. They'll tell you no because they failed. They'll tell you no because. They just, I don't know, are not happy people. And sometimes they tell you no because they think they're trying to help you. It's not always, you know, because they're being, you know, malicious or anything. But but the best advice, I mean, you life is short and, and you just have to do it. Shut the fuck up! She also explains that she's bad at taking compliments and she's clumsy. Two qualities which are excellent in a Las Vegas performer. But we never see them displayed. Believe it or not, that's something that even Stephanie Meyer got right with Twilight. We were told that Bella was clumsy, and then there were scenes where she was actually clumsy! Oh my god, I'm using Twilight defensively. My life is a lie! But eventually we do get to see Zade's audition, and it's made a little more spectacular by the fact that she can do real, actual magic. You see, Zade really isn't like other girls because she's an actual witch, which is why the book is called Handbook for Mortals, because she's an immortal, but she'll grow old and die eventually, I guess. I, the title doesn't make sense. And I've got a very lengthy rant about the magic system, but that's for later. The trick is she starts off in the catwalks about 50 feet above the stage, and I forgot to mention this, but it's a theater in the round, so keep that in mind. And next to the stage you have a small pool of water. She's given a rose, she throws it from the catwalks and it lands on stage. That's the proof that the stage is solid and otherwise untampered with. She then, sans harness, jumps off the catwalk, sparkles shoot out of her fingers into the floor. The floor catches on fire. Burn the house down! Burn them all! And then the fire turns the, the stage to water. She lands in the water and disappears, and then the stage goes back to normal, and then she appears in the pool of water with the rose in her mouth. And of course, it's a big deal, everyone's talking about it, it's this tremendous display of, oh my god, how did you do that? Without completely fucking up our stage. She's pretty much given a job as part of the show on the spot. Understandable, it's a, an impressive feat. But when the head technical director, Mac, approaches her, he has a few questions, like, how does this work? 
and she refuses to answer any of them. I didn't know if Mac was really a spoiled brat, and I knew I might have been overreacting, but I had to protect certain things, and my secrets were definitely among them. You're trying to get a job in Las Vegas, one of the biggest, showiest cities on the planet, with Charles Spellman, who has been compared to David Copperfield. And you are openly displaying magic, and the idea that someone would ask you, how does this work, never occurred to you? Your method of protecting the secret of actual real magic is putting it on full display in front of a cheering crowd? And she acts completely indignant about Mac just asking a few simple questions for good reason, mind you. OSHA compliance, making sure she doesn't alter the stage in such a way that'll affect another act, making sure that liability insurance is maintained. These are very serious issues. I was back in his face, loud and stern. Look, it was part of my deal. End of story. I didn't know Joffrey Baratheon worked here now. Attempting to maintain OSHA compliance is not the same thing as cutting off a guy's head for shits and giggles. Apparently some magicians are very tight-lipped about how some of their secrets work. Uh, Penn and Teller's bullet trick, which is amazing by the way, you should check it out. Very few people know how that actually works. Penn and Teller actually have clout and can get away with something like that with a long proven track record. Zade is a nobody from bumfuck nowhere. She has no track record. No one knows anything about her at this point. This is still day one. Spellman steps in to try to resolve the whole issue, and apparently Zade tells him how it works, but we never get that scene. It's just, he was facing the wall, but he spoke deliberately. Well, my dear, tell me everything. End of chapter. So the big focus of that entire chapter was Mac being kind of a jerk even though he was doing the bare minimum required of him for his job. So of course, Zay doesn't really like him. A feeling which will last for mm, a chapter and a half. Tonal consistency does not exist in this book. Time goes by and Zayd slowly adjusts to life in the theater. Part of this means that she needs to be measured for various costumes and such. So she's hanging out with Lil, the gothic costume designer. And for some reason, Zayd is in her underwear which you don't actually have to be, but okay. It's really an excuse for Cheesecake and for Mac to come by and notice Zade and how good she looks when she's not wearing clothes. We get a scene that steps away from Zade's first person perspective and actually goes to third person perspective following Mac. And for some reason, Mac's entire section is in italics. Now this happens sporadically throughout the book. I don't understand why, but whenever the focus is immediately taken off of Zade, it goes to italics. Now there are all sorts of small writing tricks you can do with word choice and font formatting and things like that. The Young World uh, actually was kind of clever in that way because it changed font depending upon which character uh, the prose was following. Uh, the stiff and stern leader character got, uh, like, a uh, Times New Roman, very straight-laced, very structured kind of font. Uh, the much more free-spirited uh, love interest who followed him around was something a little curvier and, and casual, like, um, I don't know, chalk duster or something. The uh, brainy guy who thought so much faster than everyone else never used punctuation. Those chapters were headaches, but my point stands. I have no idea why Serum decided to use italics for this. Normally, if you're gonna do that, it, it's gonna to, uh, convey a flashback for an entire scene, or someone's thoughts, or something like that. I can't really think of any reason why these sections needed to be italicized. It doesn't really matter. Maybe they are supposed to be like Zade's thoughts as she's interpreting what these characters are going through. Like what they're saying, what they're imagining, what they're seeing. That is pure speculation on my part. It's probably just a, a nonsense style choice that she came up with because she hit the wrong button and never went back to change it. Anyway, Max spends some time creeping outside the girls' dressing room, peeking through a cracked door like a peeping Tom, so... Uh, Great characterization there. Oh, should I mention, he's one leg of the love triangle that gets formed in this book. 
The other leg of that triangle gets introduced in the end of the chapter. Zaid finishes up with the dressing room, steps out, and literally runs into Jackson Millsap, a character that is so boring and underdeveloped that the backstory, the behind-the-scenes bit about his character is more interesting than the character himself. Sarah even spends an entire chapter describing just the collision with this guy rather than anything about him. No, but he is the leader of the house band. He is the good-looking uh, ladies' man who everyone thinks is adorable, and he definitely knows he's got that little spark that, that the ladies love. And the book does nothing with him. And he's only there for cheap, artificial, romantic tension. I'm not a fan of love triangles. I think there's some potential if they're done right, but more times than not, they're not. Love triangles really only work if the outcome is not obvious and if all the characters involved are actually interesting, like if they actually have chemistry between each other. This only has a love triangle for purely arbitrary reasons, because it's what Twilight did, and that worked so well! Just from the setup alone, with Mac being kind of a jerk and apologizing and making amends two chapters later, you know he and Zayd are going to wind up together. It is screamingly obvious. The only example of a love triangle done well that I can think of is from an anime called Fruits Basket, where you've got the main character, Toru, who kind of crushes on uh, two guys from her class named Kyo and Yuki. And there, there's a whole backstory there that makes the story more interesting. But the thing that works about the love triangle is... Both the guys are interesting in their own right, and there's real chemistry between the differing couples. It's fascinating. I, I definitely recommend you check it out because I'll see one episode and I'll decide I want to go with one pairing, and then I'll see like another episode, and then the other pairing seems more appealing. It's really conflicting because I don't really have a preferred definite. I'm kind of slanted one way towards Kyo, if I have to be honest, but Yuki and Toru are also a really good couple, so there's there's some real debate to be had there. And if anyone would like to point out how much of a dork I am, this clip is for you. No shit, Sherlock. Now, like I said, Jackson's behind the scenes story, how the character was created, is more interesting than the character himself. Nothing really happens with Jackson. You'll see him sparingly, and nothing will become of it. But you should know that Jackson Millsap is based off of Jackson Rathborn, who you will probably recognize as Jasper Frey from Twilight. He was in a band for a little while called 100 Monkeys, and like I said before, Sarum managed that band. Apparently, Jackson didn't like Sarum. I'm kind of reminded of the old story of Christian and Megan. Very similar vibes there. No, I will not go into detail about that story. It's horrifying. Anyway, unlike with Mac, Zayd and Jackson hit it off immediately. In fact, he volunteers to give her a tour around the building and offers her one of his guitars. So if she ever wants to have a quick jam session, she can walk into his dressing room, pick up the guitar, and play by herself for whatever. Ah, uh, now we're on Chapter 4, The Empress. So this one is kind of pivotal because it's the chapter where Max stops being a jerk, but we also get another one of Zade's powers. You see, Zade has the power of premonitions, and as you can imagine, it's not described well. I don't want to read the whole thing out because it is far too lengthy, but if you want to read it yourself, here it is. She stays as vague as possible, and we never actually see what this premonition was caused by. Like, she just gets some flash insight, but it it's not explained as a dream. We don't get to see what the vision actually was. She never even tries to describe it. It's just, hmm, something bad's gonna happen. I can feel it. At least when the crazy old guy in the movie predicts that there's gonna be a storm, he says, oh, my trick knee's acting up. Zayd tries warning a few people. She talks to Mac, who brushes her off, and then Zayd just goes about her day. We get a scene with her in the catwalks later on with Riley and Sophia. Sophia is complaining because her harness is uncomfortable and doesn't want to wear it. Riley is trying to talk to her to put it on anyway. And then the platform that all three of them are on starts spinning. And it starts spinning so fast that Sophia falls off. I don't know why 
you would have that in the catwalks. It seems like a tremendous risk, but okay. As soon as he reached for her arm, she spun off the platform, falling toward the ground. I knew instantly that I wasn't going to be able to grab her either, and I realized that she was bound to hit the stage if I didn't do something. I was still harnessed in, and from where I was, I was able to push her body as she was flying past me. If you're going to write a quick, snappy scene like that, you've got to use fewer words. You want to make the the prose go by faster because that makes time speed up for the reader. Zade pushes Sophia into the pool of water from 50 feet up, mind you, from the catwalks, and Sophia survives with very little uh, damage. Uh, Zaid also jumps into the pool to pull Sophia out, despite what I'm sure are an abundance of stagehands down there on that level already to pull Sophia out, but whatever. Will this actually affect Sophia being a mean girl and treating Zade a little nicer? No, not at all. She completely discounts the fact that Zade saved her life. In fact, she seems to resent it. And that would be fine if the book ever did something with it. Sophia is pretty much a non-entity for the entire book. She's there to kind of create some drama, but that drama is incredibly shallow and incredibly easily sidestepped by Zade. Her character is to exist as an easy opponent for Zade to defeat in bland conversations. And then to make up with Zade later on in the book and in fact be pulled into part of this grand, brand new stunt that Zade concocts later on. So the only thing Sophia contributes to the book in the meantime is cringy dialogue. Zade gives Sophia CPR, ambulance comes by, takes her away, Matt gets pissed off, and then uh, Zade decides to go grab Jackson's guitar and have a little jam session by herself out in the loading dock. Mac decides he needs a cigarette, so he goes out to the loading dock as well, and he and Zaid start chatting. They get some really cheap back and forth. We also find out what Zaid's full name is. And I am probably going to get this wrong, but Zaid is short for my full name. Shahara Zaid Holder. And her middle name is Esther, so I can only imagine Zade is being portrayed by a 60-year-old retiree who collects buttons. Oh, but some of this back and forth with Mac. We learn that Mac's actual name is Clark Kent, because he has boring parents. So Zade, of course, starts calling him Superman. Mac, meanwhile, starts calling her Magic Girl. Because she's a magical girl. Sadly, she's more of the overpowered Sailor Moon type of magical girl and not the Madoka Magica kind. You got a lot of chances for anime references this review. Oh, yeah. Oh, did I do it? Did I win? Also, it turns out that the both of them enjoy motorcycles. I love going fast. I like riding my own bike, but I shocked even myself when I started to think about how it might be fun to be on the back of his bike while going that fast. And they got other dialogue like that laying it on real thick, so Mac's turn from jerk to romantic interest is sharper than the ones the bikes took from Tron. And then Jackson shows up for a little bit and they get some arbitrary flirting in and that's the end of the chapter. Chapter 5, uh, we get another big italic scene where nothing really happens. We just get several pages of Sophia hitting on Mac while they're at a bar. And if you ask my opinion, I have found proof that there are no editors on staff at Geek Nation. Mac asks Sophia how she's doing after the fall from the uh, catwalks, and she says, I'm a quick healer, and I have good genes. And yes, I did, Sophia proclaimed, obviously wanting to gloss over the part where she had to admit she had done something wrong. The yes, I did part might have been in regards to him talking about her learning the lesson about the harness, but her answer was awkward. An entire freaking passage was awkward. And yes, Sophia is hitting on Mac despite going out with Spellman. We get a small note that it's been several weeks since uh, Sophia fell from the catwalk. And eventually, Zaid is invited to a cast camping party. And uh, oh goody, but Mac will be there as well. Well, Zaid's having trouble putting her tent together. Uh, Riley offers to help her at one point. She declines and he just shrugs and leaves. And despite that, Zaid thinks this. At that exact moment, 
I wished I had a guy. If I had been dating someone, anyone, then he would have also been sleeping in the tent with me, and therefore helping me put it together. Yes, the most useful aspects of men, putting up tents and opening pickle jars. But because she's having so much difficulty, Zade decides to cheat a little bit and uses some of her magic to construct her tent while no one's looking. I rubbed my hands together and thought hard about the tent rising and assembling itself. I waved my hands in elliptical motions, replaying that image in my mind. In a few seconds, my tent had risen by itself and was sitting securely on its own. As you can probably imagine, the magic system into this book is broken as hell. The core problem is we have no idea what Zade's powers really are. They come down to whatever she feels like having. Now, if you were to take something like Skyrim and uh, study the magic system there, you've got all sorts of different classifications of magic that your one character can do. Uh, conjuration, illusion, uh, restoration, destruction, a whole bunch of things, all at the same time. And they work because there are certain spell types, certain exact things that you can do with particular limits. You can't just walk up to the final boss and cast Supernova or Meteor and kill them in one hit, for example. It doesn't work like that. You have to work within the means you're given. But Zaid has no limits. Her means are apparently whatever she wants them to be. So far, what we've seen her do is she has shot fire out of her fingertips and turned a stage into liquid that she was able to pass through, so I guess that's illusion magic mixed with teleportation magic. She's got very broadly defined premonitions. She can use what I'm calling uh, telekinesis. Eventually, we're going to see her with Dragon Ball Z-style key hand laser powers, and by the end of the book, she's able to effortlessly pull memories from people's uh, minds and view them as her own. Oh, and she can read tarot cards and talk to actual spirits through them. Like, she's not reading the cards and getting lucky, she's actually talking to guardian angels. There's no set sense of limitation, there's no sense of scale, there's no kind of balance. She can do whatever she feels like doing, and she just gets away with it cost and consequence free. The magic doesn't stand for any kind of a metaphor, it doesn't stand in to represent any kind of a theme, it's not to push any particular message, it's not even to amplify the universe, it's just to make Zaid look better. Again, if that's the only thing this story has to offer, it's a boring story. Especially because the magic itself isn't even that unique. It's not like bending in Avatar The Last Airbender in which entire societies are formed around what kind of bending they can do. A magic system like this cannot really draw in an audience. There's nothing really unique or special or challenging about it. It's not like Zaid can use all this crazy magic, but it costs her one year of her life. This kind of magic system cannot draw anybody in. It doesn't explain the universe, it doesn't expand on the universe, it doesn't really expand on the character. Actually, it's surprisingly hollow. This is a story about a magical girl, but the protagonist is a hollow, underdeveloped mess. It's like you take an episode of Card Captor Sakura, only instead of interesting fight scenes, you've got a fight scene that lasts 10 seconds, and the rest of the episode is the main character studying for her math quiz. So many anime references today. So, Zaid finishes setting up her tent, and uh, she's, she's quite proud with herself, which is why we get this incredibly stupid line. With my tent up and put together with a sleeping bag inside, I figured I might as well throw that in too, I was good to go on the place to sleep front. If I ever meet a fan who writes a sentence like that and publishes it, I will smack you with your own book. And if you only publish an ebook, I'm gonna hit you with a computer. Zaid starts pining after Mac, cause he's there and he's a boy. You're a girl. He's a boy. Your parts go together. Oh, God. We also discover that Mac doesn't date co-workers because of a bad past experience with an ex who was kind of using him. Like, they were sleeping together and he thought it meant more, but she just saw it as a hookup and then kind of dragged him along. You know, did, did some damage there. And we get this from Sophia and her friend Mel who are ragging on Zaid and mocking her relentlessly for having feelings, because 
nothing's gonna happen. And I've gotta read this because of how impressively childish it is. I, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit because I'm cutting out a lot of needless prose, you're welcome. But Zayd decides to stand up to Sophia and Mel and makes herself look so cringy. If I was after him, as you've stated, then I promise you, I would have better luck than either of you. After the words came out of my mouth, I was actually surprised that I had been so bold to both of them. I was proud of myself, though. I stood and stared back at them, waiting for the response. Zade, one. Stupid girls, zero. Mel seemed offended as she snapped back. You actually think you're hotter than either one of us? Physically, I replied, no. Not a chance. You're both far more beautiful than I am, if we're talking about the outside. But have you ever bothered to see what you look like on the inside? There's a song called Ugly Girl that I swear is about both of you. I'll play it for you sometime. Snap. One trick I learned, if you're trying to have confrontational dialogue, it really pays to bounce the, your ideas off of somebody. Because sometimes you don't really get a good grasp for how somebody else may respond to a certain thought or comment. Just have a conversation with somebody as, you know, kind of role-playing. You're playing one character in the book, someone else is playing another part, additional people as needed, and get a feel for what your sentences come off as. Because if anyone had actually talked like that and said, there's a song called Ugly Girl that's about both of you, I'll play it for you, I promise the response you'll get is laughter. And the chapter ends with Jackson saying that Zayd is hotter than both Mel and Sophia. And now we're on to the chapter that I've really been looking forward to talking about. Chapter 7. It's great. Alright, chapter 7 actually contains several different scenes and it goes on for like 30 pages. So I'm going to be doing a lot to condense some of the stuff. It starts off with a bunch of cast and crew from the show hanging out with each other at a bar. There's a lot of dialogue back and forth, none of it's really interesting and or really stands out that much. And eventually Mac invites Zade out for a uh, motorcycle ride through the deserts, where eventually they get trapped by a storm and they have to take refuge uh, underneath an overpass. And they exchange a little bit more dialogue when this happens. All of a sudden, he pulled me in even closer. I hadn't realized there was any space left between us, but there was just a small amount, and with that eliminated, he kissed me. Yeah, you remember that bit I said earlier about chemistry? Uh, these two hated each other four chapters ago. There's been no time for any kind of buildup. There's like no sense of chemistry. These are just two friends who work with each other. That, that's the closest their relationship can really be defined. And if you think this is like, some pivotal moment that will lead to a relationship, forget it. Because most of the rest of the book is them kind of awkwardly trying to define what their relationship is, despite the span of several, several weeks passing, to the point where it happens like four or five times, where you just get a descriptor several weeks later. Romance stories are reliant on those cute little moments where you've got the characters slowly inching towards each other. All these two have shared are vapid one-liners that mean nothing, don't come off as cute. The only reason I can believe this is really happening is because it's the point of the book. Zade is such an amazing girl, of course all the boys want to do the kissing on her. This is supposed to be something you save for the big climactic reveal later on where, oh, we just had a small falling out over a brief misunderstanding, but we love each other. It's cliched as hell, but that's normally how it goes. There are times when you can get away with doing that earlier and having the big obvious romantic reveal uh, pretty early on in the story. The Since I'm on an anime cake, I might as well recommend this. There's an okay anime called Chivalry of a Failed Knight that's not that bad, and the main characters and and uh, the love interest end up professing their love for each other by like episode four, I think it is. But that works because we had several cute moments up to that point where the two of them were actually kind of supportive of each other. And actually it was kind of refreshing not seeing this extremely drawn out romance over the course of normally like 20 something episodes. So they chat for a bit more, they make out a little more, 
Eventually the scene just stops and then it picks up with Zade shopping at the fashion show mall. Jackson has this performance uh, outside the theater. It, he's got his own band away from all of that and they're, they've got a show coming up so Zade's buying a dress, a nice blue dress for that. With a sales clerk who is strangely interested in Zade's love life. Oh, that's fun, she paused. You work with them both? That could be messy. Be sure to come back and let me know what happens, she called from behind the register. One thing authors need to be cognizant of is how they come across in their prose. If you are hyper-focused on certain things, you could look like a tryhard, like you're trying to show off and, and go out of your way to impress people. Saren, in this next section we're about to talk about, sounds like she's trying to show off and doesn't really know what the kids these days are into. It's like a teacher trying to impress her kids by saying that she went to Woodstock. As I made my way through the main section of the mall, I saw two vaguely familiar looking figures walking towards me. I squinted as they approached. When they were nearly in front of me, I laughed aloud. Of course they were familiar. Carrot Top and Wayne Newton grinned when they saw me. You're in Las Vegas, which has some of the biggest names in entertainment. And the two you choose to write about are Carrot Top and Wayne Newton. Now, I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with those two. I'm sure they're perfectly nice guys in real life. But they're not exactly relevant. You could have had Gabriel Iglesias. You could have had Dave Chappelle. You could have had Penn and Teller. You could have had Chris Angel. Instead, she chose two celebrities whose relevance died in the 90s. Again, I'm sure they're great guys, but their names don't carry much weight anymore. And what's downright confusing is that she writes it in such a way that Everyone here knows each other. Hey guys, I said, still chuckling. I have to say, you two are the last people I would think I'd see walking through a mall together. We had to do a charity event here today, Wayne said, shrugging. We just finished. It's not like they're just being charitable to a potential fan or they're just being nice for the sake of being nice. They know Zade. Like, okay, I mean, she works as a performer in Las Vegas, is there some central hive mind they all connect to? Do they go to each other's shows? Do they meet with each other backstage? How do they know each other? What is the relationship here? Why have this scene here if it's not going to add to the story? This is, this whole thing is in here just to say Carrot Top and Wayne Newton are in the book. You guys coming to the premiere in a few weeks? I asked, brushing a strand of hair from my forehead. Wouldn't miss it, Wayne said, and I detected the genuineness in his voice. What premiere? Whose show? Are Zayn's show? Or someone else's? I don't know what's going on. There is no context here. And then, I guess to add an air of realism, Zayn gets reminded that Caratop's real name is Scott. So do they know each other or not? And how well? There is no reason for this. And when they part ways, she gives them each a quick hug. But that is not where the stupid ends because Zade has an encounter in the parking lot. Zade pauses for a moment because in the parking garage because she forgets where she parked when she gets approached by a woman her age. I know what you are, she said in a low but confident tone. I frowned at her confused. Excuse me? I know what you are. Do you? This scene is almost laughable. This woman ends up being like another witch or immortal person. I, I don't even know. She's here for quick, a quick action scene, and then she disappears in a Lamborghini, and we get one brief off-screen reference to her later on, and she's not in the rest of the book. Okay, this is gonna sound bizarre, but this other woman starts explaining Zade's Mary Sue powers. You know why guys fawn over you, and some girls can't stand you, she continued as I gathered up my bags. Even mortals can sense power. Why? Is it her skill? Her unpredictable nature? The big titties? Maybe, who knows? They don't know what it is, but I do. You should shield yourself better. But then again, it's so strong. She raised her eyebrows with a look of amazement on her face. Do you even know how powerful you are? You see guys, it's not that she's a badly written character. It's just like a central 
it's the theme of the character. She's just that powerful. It's not her fault. And then they have an extremely brief anime fight where this other woman, I, I've seen people call her Lamborghini Girl, uh, uses powers to pin Zaid against the far wall. So she responds thusly, My back was still locked to the wall, but at least I was now able to bring my hands together. I cupped them into a sphere and shoved them in the direction of the girl who stood watching with an egocentric smirk. Colored sparks of light shot forward from between my palms, sending the girl flying backward and slamming her into the garage wall. You did that, and you barely even know what you're doing, she said, shaking her head. Amazing! Well, Zaid, I'll see you around. And that is the last we even hear about her for pretty much the rest of the book. Zaid never brings it up with her mother, she never talks about it to her co-workers. The entire thing is an utter waste of time. Here's my theory though. This is sequel baiting. This character is meant to show up in this book so she can show up in the second book because now there's this unresolved plot thread. Who was Lamborghini Girl? Where did she get her powers? How did she know about Zaid? All of these questions are fucking stupid and no one is asking them. Need I remind you, this is chapter 7 out of 21. Well, 22, chapter 0 and all, but... This is the wrong time to sequel bait. That's meant for the ending. You're not even... You're not even using a bad trope correctly. Damn it, Sarah! Anyway, moving on, we've got that concert with Jackson. And we get the strangest introduction to their band. You get Jackson, Tom, Tim, Mike, Dave, and their drummer whose name I didn't know. Zade has given entire backstories on people she hadn't met that why can't this drummer at least get a name? Actually, I can tell you why. Because this band is called the Plain White Tees. The Plain White Tees is a real band. They're the ones who came up with Hey There Delilah. And according to Wikipedia, their band uh, members are made out of Tom Higginson, Dave Tirio, Tim Lopez, Mike Rotondo, and Demar Hamilton. Demar Hamilton is likely the drummer who Serum could not remember. You can Google Caretop's real name, but you can't Google the members of a band you apparently know in real life, Serum. And apparently they are extremely popular. I had to yell over the crowd pretty loudly to be heard at all. Wow! It's like they're in sync and they got the band back together or something! Serum strikes me as the type of person who constantly needs to talk just to have something to do. We also get uh, proof that Pete, one of Zade's co-workers, really does have trouble showing up to social events on time, because that's literally his defining characteristic now. I honestly can't remember anything else about the guy. They fit like two to four hundred people inside this one bar. Uh, generally, Pookie's got a pretty good bit about this in one of her videos, but I've got to point out that Las Vegas in this book is amazingly colorless. What I mean is there's no sense of scale or life anywhere in this city. It, there, there are very few scenes that happen outside the theater and or outside some nondescript bar. So we never really get a sense that they're actually in Las Vegas. Again, one of the brightest, most colorful cities on the planet. As big and vibrant a city as Las Vegas is, it feels really small in this book. There aren't really massive crowds, big events, or even big names around like the Bellagio. The biggest celebrity Zaid ever mentions is Wayne Newton. This feels like Serum set the story in Vegas, but used a lot of small town elements to construct it. Zaid doesn't go to some fashionable store, uh, store, she goes to Sally's Beauty Salon. She doesn't go to see Penn and Teller on stage, she bumps into Carrot Top at the mall. It is an extremely lackluster environment. The problem with setting a story in Las Vegas is that you should actually use Las Vegas. When Rick Reardon did that with the first Percy Jackson book, and he had the Lotus Casino, it actually felt like it belonged in Vegas. There was all these, these lights, and games, and trap. It was a well-used scene. The way Las Vegas is set in this book is so devoid of meaning that you can set it in literally any other city in the country and it still works. Anyway, Zaid is conflicted on what she should do between Mac and Jackson. She kind of likes them both, they both have their pros and cons, so she decides to use her cards in order to find out who to go for. 
And I'm just gonna bring this up because it'll be important later. My mother taught me that everyone has guides, spirit guides, who are incorporeal beings and are assigned to us before we are born. They help nudge and guide us through life. Keep that in mind for later, it will be important. I'm not terribly familiar with tarot cards. I've seen them explained well, I've seen them explained poorly. This explains them poorly. From my understanding is, you've got to shuffle the cards first, and then really focus your energy into them so you can get the right answer. And Zade focuses that energy by asking this. I am looking for who would be best overall for my highest and best good, and for his highest and best good as well. Well, someone was high when they wrote this. Zade then does a reading for herself with the cards, and she does explain what's going on, but she does it with such an abundance of, of information that it's difficult to keep track of. And sorry for the length of this, but this is a single paragraph out of several pages of descriptions like this. I told the guides I was going to lay down two piles to represent each relationship, and once again asked that the King of Wands show up to represent Jackson and the King of Cups to represent Mac. I would know by those cards which pile was about whom. I laid down seven cards together. The Eight of Wands, which is meant to represent Cupid's arrows, meant he likes me. No surprise there. The Three of Pentacles, a relationship. The Three of Cups, the Sun, and the Five of Pentacles meant it would be great, but it wouldn't be perfect. I kept reading and found the Nine of Cups, which meant all would be content, and the King of Wands. So that indicated for me that this was my future path with Jackson. Sounds pretty good. My intuition was telling me that, there, uh, that the entire combo had an extra meaning to it, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Zade under-explains and over-indulges on her tarot reading. Tarot cards are one of those things that people will understand in a very broad sense. They're cards that tell fortunes, but don't really understand the specifics very well. I can't even tell what all the basic house types are. I mean, you've got like cups, swords, pentacles, and something, chairs, I don't know. Zaid lays out multiple card names all at once, gives a vague assumed answer, then moves out with, uh, moves on without any additional context. This can only work, assuming that she's reading it correctly, uh, if the reader is as familiar with tarot as she is. Otherwise, if you're going to overload the reader like this, then you're going to lose them really damn quick. And this was a gigantic wall of text as well, so that doesn't help. If you want an example of tarot readings done right, check out The Death of Mrs. Westaway by Ruth Ware. Actually, check it out regardless, because it's a really good book. The protagonist of this book is kind of a down on her luck tarot card reader uh, who gets drawn into a rich family drama thingy, but it's it shows tarot done very effectively. Uh, the readings are done sporadically and sparingly, but with very targeted information. You don't need to know anything about tar uh, tarot outside of their cards that tell fortunes in order to understand what's going on, and you follow very easily. And I'm serious, check out Ruth Ware. She is a very good writer. She, basically, she's the modern-day Agatha Christie. Very fun mystery and thriller books. So Zayd's reading leads her with no real answers, and then we get another italics scene but this one is about Zade's mother, who's doing her own reading to check out on Zade. Check up on Zade, rather. And then she meets with a customer, and they we get a, a full scene detailing that reading. And that has nothing to do with anything going on in the story, so I'm not sure why it's in there. And then we get another pointless scene when Zade goes back to the mall. But we get one of the best lines of the book. Zaid decides that she deserves lemonade because she doesn't like malls because malls quickly make me tired and cranky quickly. That's just... wow. Authors are taught not to rely on adverbs and you use the same one twice in the same sentence fragment. Beautiful. <laughs> ah, but no, this scene is an absolute waste because the clerk working at the lemonade stand is a guy named Alan whose girlfriend is apparently nearby and thinks that Zade is flirting with him when she just pays for a lemonade. Because the universe can't have Zade lose any confrontation, no matter how petty and irrelevant, as soon as the last word left her mouth, I snapped inside. I squeezed my eyes shut tight and shook my clenched fists once more. 
The vat of lemonade exploded, sending yellow liquid and shards of glass in every direction. A general note to all authors, do not use the term yellow liquid. I don't care what you're going for. There is only one way that readers will initially interpret that. It's as bad as the yellow stream from Empress Teresa. So the jealous girlfriend gets soaked, no one else really gets hurt, and then Zayd just declares victory over the moment. I shrugged and declared, when life hands you lemons, then turned and left her on the ground. I don't want your damn lemons! What am I supposed to do with these? Chapter 9 is kind of unique in that it's the only one in which Zayd does not actually show up. It's just the one where a bunch of boys sit around talking about how cute Zayd is. It also opens up worse than any other chapter in the book. Tad, Mac, Cam, and Riley, along with Jackson and the whole band, Tom, Tim, Mike, Dave, and Damar, and an audio tech named Drew, were all standing around the stage dealing with some work issues. Oh sure, now the drummer gets a name. This all comes across like a tie-in to what Lamborghini Girl said earlier about boys not being able to resist Zade. It just comes off as cringy when all their dialogue is as direct as this. God, that girl is beautiful. It's beyond that. There is something unique and special about her. If this book were anywhere in your face about how great Zade is, you'd all get concussions. Even Jackson pipes in about how he feels. She is quite a catch, but we're keeping it light. She's the kind you want to marry, not just used to get laid. Not sure if I'm ready to give up my freedom just yet. But she'd be the girl to do it for, that's for sure, Jackson surmised. Amanda Becker's like a flower. You smell her. You touch her gently. You admire the beauty. You watch it blossom. And you thank God he created something so perfect. And because this entire chapter can be summed up as an abject waste of time, I am going to take this moment to talk about how amazingly bland this theater is. Again, this is supposed to be a show on par with something David Copperfield would, would do, but I can't tell you a single thing about any of the acts. Like, I can't even summarize the acts in a broad sense. I don't know if there are jugglers, or magicians, or knife throwers. It, it's... none of it's described. A Las Vegas level performance, and the best I can do to describe any of it is to talk about the band. They are a band. They do music. And no, we don't see any of that either. It goes hand in hand with how I described Las Vegas being this vast, unexplored property. There's, there's no color to this universe. Everything centers around Zayd to such an extent that if it goes beyond her, it's not worth describing. Actually, it's worse than that. I forgot to bring this up earlier, but a lot of the side characters who are not Zayd strike me like NPCs. You take a game like Skyrim, where NPCs have personalities to an extent. They, they have a daily routine where they wake up, they go to work, then they go hit the tavern, then they go back home, or whatever. That is exactly what all the side characters in this book feel like. They feel like they all have very narrow pathing routes. And the only thing that gets them to sidestep that is when Zayd deigns to interact with them. If your characters are bland and your universe is devoid of all description, you've got nothing to offer the reader. Actually, I just want to give this line here because this will give you an idea of what the, the humor in this book is like. Guys, it's getting late. Everyone go finish your setups. Doors are in 20 minutes. Tom commented, You know, I always feel like there's some joke there. Mac responded, What do you mean? You know, that Doors being a saying about opening the doors to let patrons come in and see the show, and the fact that the theater also gets called The House, and there's a band called The Doors, and... Mac shook his head. And you live in a van down by the river? Kid, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I know. Like I said, I haven't figured it out yet, but there's a joke there. Hmm, okay. Well, tell us if you ever find it, Tad chuckled. Not once! Did I laugh at any of the jokes in this book? Not once did I find them intriguing or charming or amusing. That right there was a terrible waste for a bad setup that doesn't even try to land. Like, what's the punchline? That the one guy was being awkward? All right, and that's where I'm gonna call it for now, actually. I've been filming for a couple of hours and we still got quite a bit of notes to go through, as well as one big controversy that I haven't even touched on yet, but don't worry. It's a good one.